There you go. I wanted to talk about the role of professional societies and uh, widening participation. And you probably know the BCS is a very large organization, but the percentage of women in the BCS is not really well known because the BCS don't actually make a record of, uh, of people, whether they're men or women. And also, there are people like me who uh, have a doctorate, and uh, now I'm a professor, and so you can't tell by my title whether I'm a man or a woman, although you can probably tell by my name that I'm a woman. <laughs> but the BC so when, uh, a few years ago, uh, we decided uh, which is now quite a long time ago, uh, in 2001, we decided to have a group within BCS for women. Uh, the BCS told us they couldn't mail the women members because they didn't know which members were women. But we have made some progress. So there is a lot of work on supporting women in STEM these days. Uh, and but the difficulty is women are still underrepresented in many of these areas. And so uh, I have been to uh, meetings uh, sponsored by UNICEF, by the EU, and within the UK, by the uh, UK uh, government and other organizations, trying to address why we lack women in these vital areas. And. Uh, I feel that the professional societies have a role to play here. And uh, many of them have recognized this and made special provision for supporting women and girls addressing the need for a better gender balance and diversity. <coughs> and there are some examples of very good practice in this area. So, uh, and explicit addressing. So this is the Institute of Physics and the Institute of Physics, uh, now probably more than 10 years ago, did a very good survey of all UK university physics departments looking at uh, the numbers and what were the problems, etc. And uh, also the Royal Society in the UK has done a lot of work. And the focus is on diversity and it isn't just about getting more women. It's about in getting groups that normally wouldn't participate in science and engineering because they may feel uh, no one in my family has been to university, no one in my family has become an engineer, etc. And uh, often it's harder for women to move forward in these areas than men. And I like to say in the UK we have a, a shortage of uh, professional engineers. If we had equal numbers of men and women in engineering, that would solve the problem tomorrow. <laughs> so, do the math. Um, and the BCS, our professional organization, uh, is very good and it has uh, called on organizations to promote a uh, culture of diversity. But I've, and it also has instigated uh, training in unconscious bias for all its committee folk. And I feel that is important. And on the front page of the BCS uh, website, uh, there is a scorecard. And whenever you're involved in any of these initiatives to um, address uh, inequalities in an area, one of the first things you have to do is take some kind of quantitative approach and count, the, count up how, you know, to quantify what is the problem. You know? And uh, one thing that the BCS women have been active in is instigating this scorecard uh, in collaboration with um, uh, a, a, a technical audit group to determine uh, the characteristics of diversity within the IT sector. Uh, and uh, so uh, if you look on this side, this side, 
these are the more recent things. The scorecard has been going for a few years. This unconscious bias training has been initiated. The past two years, the BCS has sponsored women in IT calendars, profiling role models. And uh, in the previous year, they also had an associated free ebook giving the short bios of all the women that they profile so that schools and careers uh, people could make use of it. However, BCS Women Specialist Group, which has been going since 2001, really you can think of that more as a bottom-up group. So that was women who were members of the BCS who thought, well, how come there's no provision for um, women in the BCS meetings? And they come along to meetings and there weren't very many women there and they sort of felt, well, it would be nice to have a, a group for the women. Now, ever since this, we set the, I was one of the founding members of this group, it was founded by Dr. Sue Black, and she had set up a BCS women group in the London branch. And ever since we set this group up, for some reason the BCS made us turn it into a specialist group. And I felt, this is kind of odd. So women is not a specialist area in, in computer science. Um, and I felt we should be a group like the young persons group, just a, a sort of section of BCS members, not, you know, not a specialist group. But I'm happy with open source being a specialist group because I realize not everyone in open source, um, not everyone in the BCS is interested in open source, but I feel that it could be better. So I already mentioned the scorecard, but Given all this work and that BCS Women has been going, there's still a problem, and people call it the gender gap. I personally feel, um, because I'm a little bit more focused on practical things, the pay gap is... <laughs> it's a, pay and status, because we've been Yeah, pay and status. Yes, yes. yes. But I am not a gamification person, so giving me a hundred points would not <laughs> would not encourage me. No, hundred points, yeah. Yeah, but uh, um, but like I put this in because I think it shows you know we're doing all this. Well, where are the women? And I think the professional societies still need to do more, and I think they can. So I think one of the ways in which we can overcome barriers. One is monitoring and reporting. So that's like the very first thing. It's like setting the baseline, working out what, you know, what is the you know, case. How many women have you got? Now, it might be blindingly obvious when no women show up to your meetings. But I, even I found, when you told me that, I found it odd because, well, I don't know when it was in my career, <laughs> when I was interested in VLSI design. I went to the VLSI conferences in Edinburgh, and there were a few women there. <laughs> and I don't think they've all died off. We, 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 we do get them to, uh, to, to, chip, to chip hack events. Yeah. Uh, um, uh, it, it's all conf, which is yeah. a bit next step up that doesn't get them. So after you've done the monitoring and worked out what the situation is, I think you do need to think about explicit policies uh, and codes of conduct that will encourage more women in your community. And that, that means you have to take some positive action. And I also think that diversity should be the concern of everyone. It's not just, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, it's not just the women, it's not just the uh, minorities, etc. And I think a really good example is this uh, recent he for she campaign, uh, which uh, I heard about from an engineer at Vodafone. And this is getting more chaps in the industry to recognize and acknowledge some of the problems. And uh, these are some examples. Uh, my slides will be available. I know you can't really read this. But this is the uh, Twitter open source group. They've got an explicit code of conduct about how to welcome people into the community. I think that's missing on Stack Overflow. <laughs> <laughs> oh, what, they put one up now? I don't know, there is a code of conduct. All right. But 
there are clay worms. Yes, okay. And uh, this is another example. This is the he for she uh, Twitter feed. And I heard uh, last year when Professor Wendy Hall gave a, a lecture at the BCS, and one of the things she said is that uh, when she's invited to speak on a panel, she looks to see if there are other women as well. And she also suggested that men should do men should look to see the balance of speakers when they're invited to speak. And if no women have been asked, they could write back to the organizers and say, I'm willing to give, I notice you have no women, you know, I suggest, look, look these are fantastic women who could speak at your event, uh, you know, instead of chalking up another, uh, you know, I spoke at this conference, you know. Uh, I think it would, would be good if uh, some chaps would stand down and give their place to a, a, a good woman. So, uh, one thing that I'm proposing for our group is that we have a code of conduct. Now, the BCS actually has a code of conduct, but it is more concerned with professional conduct. And I feel it would be helpful if we had a code of conduct in our meetings. Now, why am I suggesting this? Uh, a few months ago, I went to the uh, Computer Weekly Women in IT Awards. And one of the women who spoke there, who was really a fabulous speaker, had just been awarded the Mozilla Fellowship to, uh, in uh, open web uh, technology to go to the US. And I said, oh, it would be really great. Would you like to come and speak to the open source group, perhaps, when you're free? And she said, Yes, do you have a, a code of conduct for your meetings? She said, I refuse to speak at any meeting now that doesn't have an explicit code of conduct at the meetings because I have been so badly treated at some technical meetings. And of course I said, well, I'm sorry, we don't have a code of conduct, but we're really an open group. And, but I did think, that made me think, it would be a good idea if we would adopt one. So I looked, and of course, on GitHub, there is a, a code of conduct that you can modify. And do. So I have made a version of it, and it's just saying kind of, you know, sensible things. But I think it's a signal if you are able to adopt it. So if you are a member of the OSSG, you can expect to have an email about this, because we're thinking about how we could adopt this, and so that this, you've heard it here, I'm proposing it now. Um, and really, there are other organizations that have similar things that they've derived from this, so we'd be following, and I thought this one was particularly nice, it's a, a contributor covenant from an uh, open source uh, project, so there are various um, approaches in this way. So what are the steps? I think raising awareness, polling our members, agreeing on the form, and uh, then promoting it, monitoring its effects. And hopefully we can get this in place so we can get the Mozilla fellow when she comes back to the UK to come and speak to us. So that's all I have to say. And. Uh, Thank you for listening. I'm happy to answer questions. I hope that's not controversial. <laughs> well, I think, I mean, just picking up on two things there, well, I don't want to get a big bump fight over this, but basically, you know, we're talking about, when, when we talk about the gender pay gap, I mean, I, I mean, oh, I, that's my yeah. personal. No, 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 there is, no, there is, there is, there is some, um, you know, there's, there is another argument to that. I mean, I mean, uh, I somehow send up this as a women's hour occasionally, you know, basically, and they, they've discussed that on there. And what, what, one of the, I mean, I'm, I'm just guessing that if it's, if you're just boiling it down to STEM, you know, as a pay gap in that area, one of the, one of the, one well, of the, I think it's across the piece uh, for women. Uh, okay, okay, yeah. 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 One, of the, one, of the pro, one of the problems, one of the problems when, 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 when you say that, it, it is in actual fact, that in the public sector, that, you know, there are, there are, in the civil service, for example, there's at least two thirds women to one thirds men, and, and, and so when when you start averaging things out, of course, in the public sector, the the, the, the wages are 
the throw things up in the wages that the wages are generally lower than they might be say in, in the city of London so uh, it may it, you know it's, it's always a bit of a dangerous argument. Right. I think yeah. uh, usually yeah. when people talk about the pay gap they talk about comfort. Well if it's in so, no, but that, that know, would be illegal I, wouldn't it? If I've spent most yeah, of my illegal. career working in British universities and yeah. unfortunately um, you know the the pay is equally poor yeah. for a minute. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's what I'm saying. It could be. Sorry, that's what I'm saying. But one thing I want to say yeah. is, a lot of there has been there was a famous uh, uh, book uh, on this. So someone had done research, and basically what they concluded is that women don't ask for higher pay, exactly. and that's why they don't get it. Yeah. But my attitude is, uh, you know. And I had a really good conversation with a friend of mine who works at Google, who is an engineer at Google, and has a fabulous uh, uh, video online about uh, unconscious bias. You know, at least in many technical areas, people recognize you for your technical skills, and you are paid for those. So I think that's a good thing. And like she said, at Google, she felt she was paid well for her technical skills, good. as good as the men. But you've identified a flaw in management training, because no good manager should be, be purely reactive on wages. It's an appalling way to manage. Absolutely. Um, you, yes. should, you shouldn't give someone a pay rise because they ask, and you should give someone yes. a pay rise because they because deserve it. Because they're worth it. it. Yeah, because and whenever, I've said, whenever a woman has been winging to me, she's just found out that all the guys in her department are getting more than she is. And I said, I'm just like going there and telling you to leave them as they cough. And most times, if a woman does that, she will get, if not all the money, yeah. at least some of them. Yeah, that it can't work for me, right now. <laughs> but but I, I, it is bad management, yeah, in my opinion. Not, absolutely. You know, I agree totally. I think, I think uh, you know, I think it's, you know, you have employees, you have a duty of care, you should pay them a fair wage, you know, otherwise you're a cheat, in but my opinion. It is an unconscious bonus, isn't it? That's the thing. Yeah. That, that, you know, I'm not ashamed to give my opinions. <laughs> I hope you stop filming now. <laughs> no, no, you've, you've got two minutes, 40 seconds left of rant. Right. So. <laughs> no, no, I'll stop ranting. <laughs> yes? I think the difficulty is that you kind of reward assertive, competitive, masculine behaviour and you're basically saying, well, women have to ask in order to get, rather than actually valuing some of the less assertive, competitive, masculine skills that are valuable, like empathy and working and collaborating that aren't recognised as valuable assets yes. to a, a diverse yeah. Well, I think, if, I think we do need to recognise those. Uh, there's an interesting thing that, that is happening now in this area. Um, one of the last pieces of legislation in the, the last government before the election was um, that they, they issue proposals to people for finding out <coughs> what sort of measures were they need to implement because they're going to be asking companies over 250 people to publish the statistics of pay oh, yes. in multiple yeah. areas. Yeah. Um, I'm doing some research into the company, mm -hmm. and interestingly, what that's doing is it's largely geared around some male or female, but because of the analysis it's required to do it, it's making companies look at the whole reasons for any gaps they've got. Mm -hmm. Because as soon as these gaps get published, the the danger is that no, there, there could be litigation of people saying they're unfairly paid. But the side effect is it's making them look at any differences that come up. Mm, so I think there's a, there's a growing awareness of just like the diversity and, and having reasons for it rather than just blindly applying to Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I think economically there is a strong case for diversity. And I think the Scandinavian countries, uh, when they brought in quotas for boards, are a really good example. And when they brought them in, uh, they didn't get full compliance. When they had financial penalties associated with them. They got full compliance. And now, because they are actually getting benefits from having diverse boards, they actually have above their quota. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's like, um, uh, this is what I say, you know, it's like teaching a child good manners. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> you, know, uh, um, you know, you might have to force them at first, but then they'll be so rewarded by everyone being nice to them that they'll be well mannered anyway. <laughs> yeah, that's a really good idea. And I speak as someone who doesn't have any children. But <laughs> 
I understood the logic of this argument. <laughs> and I have seen it, some evidence well, you of it. Man, you? Pardon? You were taught man, you? Proposing this code of conduct. You know, like most people, I hope something like that will fall away. We won't need it. We won't need to say, please be opening and welcoming and don't, uh, you know, do, do, do. be nasty to people. You know, goodness me. But do you think, because I mean, I certainly, I've, I've got to say, I've not seen, uh, I, can, I mean, obviously what the code of conduct is saying is, is pretty straight, you know, it's pretty clear what it's saying. But I, 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 I must, I must be. You know, I don't know. I, I haven't really seen any evidence of that at any OSSG events. But I mean, you know, I, Neither no, have I. no, 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 no. That's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. It's a, oh. I, I, I can. One, of, one of the dangers with a code of conduct there is you, 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 you can. You know, well, from, you know, I'm not, not going to have a go, but you can instill a sort of sense of paranoia where everyone's kind of, you know, it, 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 when, especially when you're talking about use of words. And when you talk about innovation, it's possible that you, you know, you maybe can just tip over there, and, and it can maybe stifle I, innovation. I, I disagree with that because oh. I don't view it as like a contract in, a, a, in any form of supply. You, you only ever get want a contract and be looking at a contract when it goes wrong to be able to get out. But you, uh, uh, before that, it's all about relationships, and it, it's it's there for the protection if needed. But you, of course, you don't want to use it, and I would I would concur. Yeah, yeah. No one should want to. To use it, um, but it's there for the, the the woman that you're you're thinking about because she's had a bad experience. So here's the evidence that this group is not going to give her that experience. Yes. And so for she'll come along mm -hmm. hopefully, and she won't have that experience. So yeah. she'll never bother to look at it, but she knows it's there if 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 if, if need be. And I think it's all to, to the good for that. Yeah. I think one of the other strengths of having conduct is that you hope you don't need it, but. Because it's there, if sort of, uh, no, some sort of dispute or some problem does arise, you've got an effective tool for dealing with it and then minimising it before it gets too big as well. Yes. You've got a reason for asking somebody to, to leave or to change the behaviour that's clear. That you don't get in an argument about making up all you know, what you think. Yeah, I think mm. it's also important how you enforce those kinds of things that you don't go to DEF CON and go on, you know, as the first step. You know, some guy says something daft, there's no need to actually you know, nail his head to the yeah. yeah. board. That's my concern, that, you, that you, you publish a thing like this, you've not had any issue, and the problem is that you then get, let's say this committee changed, let's say, which is, you know, <coughs> five years time, you get a yes. different set of people, and it, it's rather... I, I used to work in the civil service, and some people sort of decided to send watchers, you know, rather than doers. So, you, you know, and essentially, it, it, there's always that danger with, 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 with bringing something in where, it, where, where potentially it's not, it's, there's no evidence that there's been a problem before, and you get watchers, and then they, they start, it, I mean, especially in, in certain areas where they make a job for themselves, so they watch, and then they, you know. You know. <clears throat> Yes. Have I ruled out the code of conduct as members of the British Community Society? Yes, the, but it is much more concerned with your professional conduct that you will not, uh, uh, you know, when you're carrying out software engineering, mm -hmm. uh, you know, uh, say it's the sort of thing that could be brought into play. If it was true, I'm not sure, I, I haven't seen the evidence that the in software engineers at Volkswagen uh, or of Volvo, of, you mm -hmm. know, who were designing the, you know, who, that they knowingly were breaking the law. They don't end up. Pardon? They don't end up. Well, I don't, I, I don't know. Uh, I'm not sure whether they were scapegoated or not, or who knows, but I'm sure the evidence will come out. But it's like unprofessional behavior in the practice of your profession. So. But more than that, I mean, it's, uh, I mean, I mean it is, it's, it's, you know, yes. so, so, yeah. Okay, well, okay. well I'm standing between you and our sandwiches, so please. Uh,